All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going, team? Here, and this is BXGS Weekly, episode seventy-two. Apologies for making a stream a bit earlier, but uh, as you might or maybe not really uh, hear, I am getting a bit sick over here, and I'm not completely sure I'm gonna be able to stream in a couple of hours. <laughs> so I thought I would do it early and just you know get over with it, basically, and. Uh, then go be sick. Um, so let's get started. Luckily for me, we don't really have that many things to talk about here today, but there are some interesting stories. So as usual, the first section is getting started articles that will get you started with just about everything. And the first article we got here today is getting to know Puppeteer using practical examples. It's really a nice collection of, uh, well, Puppeteer examples that will guide you through using Puppeteer starting from, you know, launching the browser or uh, the cool thing is that it's not just talks about the Chromium, but it also talk about the Firefox fork, um, accessing the browser context, debugging, and then going through the actual actions like navigating pages, emulating devices, and so on and so forth. So if you are looking into Puppeteer and wanted to give it a shot, but weren't exactly sure, you know, how to get started, then do check this article out. It will get you started in no time. Next article we got here is the minimal Node.js with Babel setup. If you wanted to get started with Node.js and wanted to use uh, ES 2019 plus that is not yet shipped in Node.js, Babel will help you and this article will explain in about 10 minutes on how to set it up with Node.mon, Babel and uh, yeah, just get rolling with it. It's nothing super special, but uh, if you are just getting started with Babel, do check it out. It's a very nice tutorial. Next article we got here is faster web navigation with predictive prefetching. This is essentially a tutorial on guest.js where he talked about it, I think about a year ago, it's actually was uh, the guest.js itself was released quite some time ago. But um, yeah, it's, it's just a nice introduction showing how the predictive prefetching can make your website a lot faster. Uh, there's also a video talk here from the Google IO conference. So if you're more interested in videos, you can just watch it. But overall, it's a pretty nice tutorial that shows you how to configure that. So if you're interested, do check it out. Next tutorial we got here is the many ways to include CSS in JavaScript application, a nice overview of all the ways essentially you can include CSS into your JavaScript apps, starting with the good old style sheets using the link tag, and going to CSS modules, CSS and JS and all that kind of stuff. So if you are I guess just getting started with the more complex uh, JavaScript applications and not sure how exactly to style them, then do check this overview out. It is not, I wouldn't call it comprehensive, but it does give a nice overview of all the existing options essentially. Next thing we got here is Next.js practical introduction, pages and layouts. Uh, it's a pretty cool introduction to Next.js. So if you wanted to get started with it, but didn't know where to start, this does a very good job of introducing the basic concepts and showing you how to create a very basic application, I guess, uh, with custom layout, which is, I guess, one of the most important bits that is typically missed in the docs, I guess, like, I mean, they have a docs for it is just not obvious and not explained uh, on the next JS web page itself, right. So this website does a this article does a very good job of showing that off how to build your pages, how to build your layouts, how to use them all together for your server side rendered react apps. So if you wanted to get into Next.js, do check this one out. Next article we got here is simple guide to finding a JavaScript memory leaks in Node.js. While it says it's simple, it's actually a very comprehensive and very long. So as you can see here, the um, scroll bar is pretty damn big here. And uh, it's a really cool article on finding memory leaks in Node.js. It's a very comprehensive very in depth uh, tutorial, essentially why the memory leaks happen, how to track them um, using garbage collection, how to make sure it's an actual memory leak, not just delayed garbage collection and stuff like this. So if you're working with Node.js and you were, you know, looking for memory leaks and didn't know where to start, do check this one out. It basically will explain everything you need to know. Hey, Custer, good morning. Welcome to the stream. Okay, next article we got here is understanding the JavaScript SEO basics, an article from Google Lab developers team, which is quite great that explains how exactly does SEO works in JavaScript with, with regards to JavaScript content and dynamically generated content on your website. So as you might know, the Google bot actually does execute JavaScript. But there are caveats. So if you are working on a websites that have dynamic content, and you are using JavaScript and don't have server side pre rendering, 
then definitely check this one out. It will basically explain how exactly Google handles websites like this and what do you need to do to basically rank better. So that's a very nice tutorial. And uh, yeah, it's not, you know, not exactly amazingly large, but it does outline all the basic things you need to know. All right, that is it for the getting started section. Now we are coming to the articles and news. We do have some interesting things here today. So the first one is faster fractals with multi-threaded WebAssembly. A pretty neat look at the um, WebAssembly and generating fractals, right? So this, the task is super simple. So we take the WebAssembly, we write the fractals module, and we generate a fractal, right? So first the author actually starts with generating the fractal using the uh, web worker and offloading into, its, in, into a separate thread, which, you know, I mean, it works and you won't block the main thread, but it's not exactly fast, right? Um, and then he builds the WebAssembly module that does the same, but in WebAssembly, obviously. And then he tries to make this module parallel and compare the performance. So if you're interested, do check it out. I just want to highlight the results. So he has a machine with four cores and the results were the following. If it was one thread, it took 11 seconds to generate like a full on large fractal. That is pretty complex to be honest. <coughs> Apologies. Um, um, uh, hey, protocol. Yes, sure. Ask your question. Uh, let me just finish <clears throat> with this article. So on two threads, the time cuts nearly in half. It was 5.7 seconds. Four threads did not have such a drastic impact. It was just 4.2 seconds. Uh, but yeah, it is very interesting. So, you know, if you have any interest in uh, WebAssembly, then definitely check it out. There is some pretty cool information here. Again, multi-threaded WebAssembly is not yet uh, available for, so it's like, I think it's behind the flag still in Chrome. So be sure to uh, take account, um, the account for that. This is what I want to say. Um, you want to make software to take, say, 10 servers or firewalls in the server rack and be able to suggest where to move equipment around to distribute the heat. Oh boy, okay, that sounds right. Okay, yeah, that sounds like some simulation stuff. <laughs> Lobsters is a very nice website, yeah. It's basically a hacker news, but um, slightly different people, I guess. It's not as focused on technical news. Um, okay, um, so what we, I mean, feel free to ask your question. Meanwhile, I will continue. Uh, I will continue with the article. So the next article we got here is, is post message slow? Um, I remember someone in our Discord server actually was asking the same question, you know, how big is the overhead of post message when you communicate with the web workers? And this is exactly what this article answers. So it's, it's a pretty in-depth dive into the web workers and the post message overhead that it adds when you actually share the data between the web worker and your main thread which is quite interesting. So uh, it also accounts for breadth and depth of objects that you actually share and serialize. And while there is an overhead, I mean, for you, you know, you cannot share the data without having some overhead, right? It actually seems to be not that significant if you have a small enough object. And uh, yeah, it's like there's, there's nice charts in here and there's a pretty detailed explanation of what exactly happens. Obviously, the slower your device is, the more um, the slow is the, the, the more overhead you will get in terms of milliseconds or nanoseconds in this case, but it's still not as terrible. So you can split the data and um, the author here in the end suggests chunking it if you need to have the smallest overhead possible. So chunking and sending a lot of smaller messages would actually result in better performance than sending one big one, which is um, quite interesting to be honest. So yes, if you are working with web workers or you are wondering how much overhead does the messaging between the worker and the main thread has, definitely check this one out. It is quite good. Next article we got here is efficient behavioral tracking in JavaScript applications. A pretty good write up on behavioral tracking and analytics essentially of what users do in your app uh, from the perspective of JavaScript and you know coding that within your client side application. As a variety of approaches here and um, various ways of doing that. So this is exactly what they describe. They look at uh, how you can track that, what is the advantages and disadvantages of each approach and which one works in a boat, uh, best in a which ways. 
So if you are curious, do check it out. There is some interesting um, things here. So if, I mean, you know, I, I think, I guess this is only applicable if you're working on a large enough product that needs this kind of analytics, right? I mean, typically it doesn't really matter or you can gather a majority of them from the backend, but sometimes behavioral tracking can open um, pretty interesting insights into your customers. Anyway, continuing, we got analysis of Google Keep WebAssembly module, a pretty nice uh, write up on how to take the existing WebAssembly module, in this case, Google Keep WASM module, how to disassemble it and figure out how it was built, what it is doing and uh, you know, what exactly was used to build it. Which I found to be pretty interesting, to be honest. So I, I for example, I didn't know that you could get the build information from it. So you can actually, when you disassemble the WebAssembly module, you can know what was the tool chain, when was the build date, what is the production server, what was the building software and so on and so forth. This is pretty fascinating. So again, if you have any interest in WebAssembly, make sure to check this one out. There is some interesting information here. Okay, I think the last one we have here for today is actually the scientific paper that is called Not So Fast, Analyzing the Performance of WebAssembly versus Native Code. So this is like a full-on scientific paper, as I already mentioned, and this is a study that compares the WebAssembly to C and C++ languages. Uh, for the performances, it sets so the speed, right? And uh, as it turns out, the WebAssembly is not quite there in terms of speed yet. While in some cases it actually is very, very close to the native speeds. On other cases, it can be as slow as you know, like two times. And I believe there was like even three times, nearly three times slower than the native code, which I guess is going to be optimized in the end, right? Because the um, engines do incredible job in speeding stuff up, but for now it is not exactly fast, let's just put it this way. I guess it's still a lot, so it will be interesting to have this study and then compare the results to the same benchmarks in JavaScript. I'm guessing WebAssembly would be a lot faster than JavaScript, but still slower than native, which you know is kind of expected. But nonetheless, there is some interesting conclusions in here, so if you are interested and if you can stomach the scientific paper, then do check it out. There is some pretty cool stuff in here. Okay, that is it for the articles and news. Now we're coming to tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness. The first thing we got here today is what's wrong with promise all settled and promise.any. So the promise all settled is this new uh, promise API that's been added just recently that basically waits for all the promises to settle in some way, right? And the author here goes to argue that the naming of majority of the promise actions, as in any race and all, are is a bit confusing. Well, no, not a, not a bit, honestly. Like if you take all those four functions: promise dot all, promise dot all settled, promise dot race, promise dot any, and ask anyone, I think, to explain on top from top of their head without looking into the docs, what do they do? I'm guessing almost nobody will get it correctly because it's not that clear, right? Unless you work with these um, methods on a daily basis, then obviously you know, but it's not exactly clear. Uh, he offers a better naming, which I think is spot on. So this is a lot more understandable. So instead of promise all, you get promise all fulfilled. All settled remains the same because it's actually a good name. Race becomes one settled and any becomes one fulfilled, which makes perfect sense and way easier to understand than actually race and any. Um, but yeah, it's it's a pretty nice write-up. It does explain what all of those do. So if you're curious, do check it out. The naming could definitely be better. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting point nonetheless. Okay, continuing, we got Global This is now available in Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and Node.js, so you can just use it anywhere. And there's a nice uh, article from V8 Dev Team that shows what Global This is and how it was polyfilled, which is terrifying. I think we already talked about this a couple of months ago. Uh, but yeah, if you're curious, do check it out. Next thing we got here is the, um, I guess, uh, official, or I guess another highlight of this. We already talked about it three or four times. <laughs> But the fact that for the large JSON compatible objects, the JSON parse is actually faster than JS object literals. So if you are um, using the big payloads and doing a code load, the JSON parse is actually faster than JS literal. So uh, be sure to keep that in mind. Again, as I already said last time, I think there's like Babel and Next.js and a bunch of other frameworks already make use of it. Uh, so 
the interesting point here is that the Matthias uh, here actually benchmarked it in Hermes, the new Facebook engine for React Native. And uh, JSON parse speed up is 11.2 times faster than the template literals, which is insane. So make sure to use this optimization when it makes sense because it looks like pretty, you know, a <laughs> very efficient one. Okay, next thing we got here is bypassing anti-incognito detection in Chrome. As you remember, the Chrome, um, what was it, 74, basically released a fix for um, request file system bug that made the incognito mode detectable. It's no longer detectable. And people already found another way to do that. So apparently if you use navigator storage estimate, the incognito mode will give you a different estimation than the normal mode. And uh, yeah, there's already like, I think there's already two or three more ways to do that, but it's like the <laughs> never ending game of, you know, mouse and cat essentially. But quite interesting. If you are interested in details, do check it out. Next thing we got here is the announcement from Google Security Block. They are increasing the rewards uh, amounts for their security program. So if you report a vulnerability and they accept it, uh, you will get awarded. You can get awarded. The um, Actually, the baseline award is now tripled. So uh, before it was like 5,000 US dollars. Now it's 15,000 US dollars. And the maximum reward is upped from 15K to 30K, which is pretty damn significant to be honest. So they must be very sure they have very little errors in the Chrome OS or uh, Chromium. But this is like really impressive and really cool. So if you're a security researcher, there is some good news for you here. Okay, next thing we got here is the MDN's first annual web developer and designer survey. So um, MDN and Mozilla are doing the dev survey I need your responses. So if you have some time, do go through it. It is not very long. I think it took me like about seven minutes to finish. Uh, yeah, just take a survey and we'll see the results. And I'll be very curious to see what the answers are. Okay, and the last thing I think we got here. Yes, this is the last thing for today is the uh, NPM uninstall co-founder Global. Lori Voss rides off into the sunset waving goodbye. So one of the co-founders of NPM and chief data officer at NPM, Lori Voss, left the company. Now this is, you know, it's 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 doesn't sound too terrible until you start reading the article, right? So it's just like, yeah, okay, another person left the company because, you know, his views that are, or her views doesn't align to the um, company politics. But the terrifying thing here is not that. The terrifying thing is right in the middle of the article where there's a, so let me just highlight this. Uh, she added that she heard rumors, um, bah, 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 NPM Inc. CTO, wants to eliminate the NPM public registry, presumably leaving only a paid enterprise service. That doesn't make sense to her, she said, since this would be killing their only competitive advantage. Just think about it. So she left in among other things because she heard that um, CEO and CDO want to kill off the public NPM registry. Now imagine NPM killing off public registry. What do you think will happen? Like, first of all, <laughs> I feel like it's gonna make the company collapse essentially because let's be honest, there is a better private registry options than NPM, right? If you want self-hosted enterprise solutions, there is stuff like our refactory that is already widely spread. And likely if you are an enterprise company, you already buy the license for it anyway, and it includes NPM. So why would you pay NPM if you already have a solution in-house? Um, and then, you know, for the public people, I like there's already people like going around saying, okay, so GitHub and Microsoft just gonna buy them and integrate it directly into GitHub, which might as well end up happening, but it is a weird ass situation. But yeah, if you're interested in more details, do read the article, there's some more interesting data in here, but it's the whole situation is just not looking so good for NPM unless they do something amazing in the next week or months, I guess. Yeah, this is not gonna end well. The best situation so far looks like really the acquisition from Microsoft or someone. But uh, yeah, oh boy, if they really close the public registry, I really hope the Microsoft GitHub, uh, sorry, the GitHub would actually release the public registry a lot faster than they are doing it right now. But okay, um, this is it for the tips, tricks and bit-sized awesomeness. Now we are coming to releases. We got some, um, some nice ones today. So the first one we got here is Docs version two. It's a docs generator and on version two, they actually migrated to Gatsby as bundler. 
Um, and uh, yeah, it's a lot faster, it's a lot nicer. It has the Gatsby API and hooks. It has the supports for custom themes now because Gatsby has them obviously. So if you are building docs and you wanted a nice generator, then do check it out. It actually looks quite nice. I personally don't know. I mean, I've been using Gatsby extensively for the past three weeks now. And I think if I would ever need to generate anything static, I would just take Gatsby itself because it is mind blowingly well, like built and, you know, working amazingly well for us. Uh, but yeah, <clears throat> next release we got here is ExaFrame version five. Uh, this is a software that I released, uh, shameless plug here. And I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. So ExaFrame 5, if you've never heard about ExaFrame, it's a tool that simplifies the deployments. It allows you to deploy your stuff in one command using Docker. By default, it has templates for Node.js, um, static HTML apps. Uh, what else was there? I forgot. Okay, whatever. So it has the default templates for Docker, so you don't even have to write Docker files. You can just run one command and it will deploy it for you. And now I've added the support for JavaScript functions. So you can actually write a function and deploy it immediately into your ExaFrame server. So like, you know, if you need an HTTP endpoint that just does one thing, you no longer have to create or install any frameworks. You can just write a module exports and then return something that you need and then just deploy that with one command. It works relatively well. Uh, it also supports a worker, so you can deploy worker functions as in background worker, you know, it will do something in the background. In this example, it just does the set interval. And you can also do custom triggers and custom trigger handlers. For example, you, if you have a database deployed, you can actually connect to it, do queries every, I don't know, um, 30 minutes or something. And if there is new data, you can actually send a trigger within the ExaFrame functions so that other function will react to this trigger and do something else. So you can basically have your own, I, I mean, I wouldn't compare that to Amazon Web Services, but kind of like Amazon Web Services structure, basically. Does works quite well. I've been using it in production for the past few weeks, I guess, before releasing it uh, to everyone. And uh, yeah, just give it a shot if that sounds interesting. The next release we got here is TypeScript 3.6 beta version with a stricter generators and uh, there was something else. And yeah, more accurate array spread. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff with like UX improvements and everything. So if you're using TypeScript, make sure to check it out. Next release we got here is Draft.js from Facebook. The framework they have for React for building uh, editors that hasn't been updated for more than a year, I believe. So they released version 0.11 with a ton of things. There's like a very big list of change stuff. And uh, if we go to releases, I think version 0.10 was released back in 2018. Yes, it was in January 2018. So that's like way more than a year. Um, so it's quite interesting to see that it's still developed. Uh, so if you're using it, make sure to update and check the um, change log. The draft chest itself is actually pretty good. I've used it in a couple of projects. It was pretty wide, I mean, pretty fine, you know, it was like some caveats, some small bugs, but hopefully they will get, will get fixed with this release. Okay, um, that is actually it for the releases. Now we're coming to the libraries and demos section. The first thing we got here is Express JVT, an example for creating verifying JSON web tokens using Express. So if you wanted to use JVT with Express but didn't know how to start, then this basically has you covered. So it's a very nice project sample that shows you how to um, set up everything and how to validate the JSON web tokens in your Express app. So if you were curious, do check this one out. Next thing we got here is React Kiwi dropdown and minimal, easy to use and highly adjustable React dropdown. So yeah, it's just, you know, another dropdown that allows you to uh, do crazy stuff like show Kiwis in there or bananas. I'm, and it also allows multi-select and everything. Like looks fine. It's, yeah, I, <laughs> maybe you were looking for something like this. Do check it out. The next thing we got here is Angu, a small DSL interpreter that can be used to evaluate simple expressions. In the example here, they built basically a calculator that evaluates, you know, one string expressions and calculates the result, right? Um, I mean, I guess it could be useful in some cases, but I personally would say that it's better to, if you, you know, if you need to parse anything, it's proper to use full on grammar and generate parsers based on that grammar. Although this might be quite handy in some cases as well. Okay, next thing we got here is Marked. This is actually not a new project, but I don't think I've talked about it on BXGS yet. 
So here we go. Uh, it's a markdown parser and compiler built for speed. Uh, and yes, it is like one of the fastest and it's been downloaded an incredible amount of times, like over a hundred million times already. So it is quite good. So if you're working with a markdown and you want to render it in a very fast and efficient way, then do check marked out. Next thing we got here is testing library JSTOM. Uh, if you never heard about testing library, it's a really cool collection of, well, testing libraries, I would put it this way, that make testing things a lot easier. Primarily, I think it started from the testing library uh, for React. And now it's like they have helpers for everything. And this JS DOM extension is really awesome. So it essentially allows you to extend uh, DOM, uh, sorry, JEST to add the helpers that would allow you to test DOM related things. Stuff like, you know, dots to be disabled or dots to be empty or dots, I, what else is there? It's like to be in a document or like there's basically a ton of the helpers here that would help you simplify, you know, instead of doing manual um, query selectors and manual property access, you can just use one nice function like to be visible or not to be visible. And all of that works with Jest. So if you are doing a lot of dumb testing, do check it out. This seems to be very, very handy. Okay, next thing we got here is three dev tools and experimental dev tools from 3GS team. So if you're working with 3GS and you wanted a nice dev tools, do check this one out. Um, unfortunately, they don't really seem to have a lot of documentation here, but um, if you follow the team on Twitter, um, they've posted some videos and GIFs of this and it looks amazing. Like if you work with 3GS, this just looks mind blowing. So make sure to try it out. Next thing we got here is movable. Movable, draggable, resizable, scalable, rotatable elements that are also available as a React and Preact components. And uh, yeah, that's a nice GIF that shows off what you can do. Basically wrap any element in the movable um, component, I guess, and then you can move, drag, rotate, resize it, and it seems to be working quite well. So if you are looking for something like this, do check it out. And yeah, by default, it works without React or Preact. So, you know, you can just use it with plain JavaScript. Next thing we got here is Recta, direct printing from browser. And uh, by that, they mean direct printing from a JavaScript API. So this actually allows you to build the document that you wanna print programmatically by using the function calls, which I guess can be helpful in some cases. So maybe you, you know why you would need that. So do check it out. I don't know, I personally, whenever I needed to print, I just created the prints uh, CSS style. I forgot how exactly you call it, layouting CSS or whatever. But uh, yeah, maybe you want to print something specifically from JavaScript, then now you can do that. Next thing we got here is Digestive uh, cross-platform SHA2 hash digest. Uh, so yeah, this, yeah, is just a SHA, uh, SHA2 hash digest that work cross-platform and Node.js and uh, I believe in browser as well. So if you are in need of doing SHA2 cross-platform, then do check it out. Next thing we got here is GraphQL Zeus autocomplete client library with strong GraphQL typed queries. So if you're working with GraphQL, I would highly recommend checking this out. This um, actually does give you quite a pretty, like really good auto suggestion for GraphQL queries. And uh, it can make your life a lot easier if you write a lot of them. So do check it out. Next thing we got here is rollup plugin off main thread. Someone made a rollup plugin that uh, uses workers and uh, moves all the workload essentially off the main threads. <clears throat> Apologies. Oh man, <clears throat> I'm definitely getting sick and this is not fun. <clears throat> okay, so yes, you can uh, essentially take your load off the main threads, right? And allows you to use the new worker and it also seems to shim the workers and modules. Okay, so basically allows you to use workers even when the browser doesn't support them, it auto shims them and auto adds supports for the modules, which is pretty damn impressive. So if you wanted to use workers in your build and uh, you package stuff with rollup, do check it out. Next thing we got here is testing library user event. Simulate user events for React library. So this is um, work in progress and it's still not completely stable, but you know, it's, it looks really cool. So the idea is that um, you need higher level abstractions to interact with your 
component testing components, right? So you don't want to manually trigger like click or whatever. You actually want to simulate the user behavior. And this is exactly what user event does. So it has a bunch of helper functions that actually simulate what would what the user would do to the specific element. Like click it, double click it, type something in the input, select the option and so on and so forth. So uh, yeah, do check it out. It looks pretty nice. Next thing we got here is React Native Image Crop Picker, a pretty nice component for picking and cropping an image for React Native. So if you're working with camera a lot, do check it out. Next thing we got here is SVGO, Node.js tool for optimizing SVG files. Uh, hey, good, good RPA, welcome to the stream. Thank you. I mean, you know, I'm doing this pretty much weekly and uh, yeah, it's, I'm doing this anyway. I'm reading the news anyway, so why not talk about that? <laughs> okay, continuing, we got SVGO, as I said, SVG Optimizer. This is a nice command line uh, tool built on Node.js that will allow you to significantly optimize your SVG files uh, to make them smaller and more efficient. Uh, if you ever work with SVGs, you know that a lot of tools like Illustrator or Photoshop or whatever uh, that ge can generate SVGs more frequently than not actually generate very large SVGs that are not efficient. And tools like this will allow you to cut their sizes quite a bit. So if you're working with SVGs, make sure to check this one out. It might save you a few kilobytes. Next thing we got here is functions framework Node.js, a function as a service framework for writing portable Node.js functions. Uh, so this is from Google Cloud Functions uh, team and it seems like it's basically a Google Cloud Functions environment that you can run locally, which is quite handy. So if you're working with Google Cloud Engine and uh, you're working with uh, functional deployments, then yeah, check this one out. It might help you do this locally and test your functions locally. I mean, it's not exactly the most easy tool to use because there's still some like flags and additional things that you have to set up. But uh, the fact that you can actually do that is quite neat. Okay, next thing we got here is ListMonk. This is not purely JavaScript, it's actually a Golang based and React, uh, but it's a high performance self-hosted newsletter and mailing list manager for more with a modern dashboard. Um, I thought it was just a pretty cool looking uh, tool, I guess. Uh, so I wanted to highlight it. Uh, so if you're working with mailing lists and you know you wanted to self-host or maybe newsletters, then do check this one out. Maybe this is exactly what you're looking for. Dashboard looks absolutely beautiful. All right, next thing we got here is React Worlds. This is, um, I mean, it's a demo in React that just of, uh, showcases different ways of using React components to build things like this. It's essentially, like a platformy thing with animations, I guess, like almost like a video game. And yes, this is all built in pure React and you also have the autoplay so you don't have to scroll actually. If you're curious how this was built, do check the source code out. It is quite interesting. Okay, and the last thing we got here today is Smash Test, the language for rapidly describing, uh, de describing, describing and deploying test cases. And uh, it's built uh, based on Node.js essentially. Looks curious, like I don't know if I would use that. I think I'm too used to Jest, but it does look interesting and it does like support for multiple browsers and devices, can run tests in parallel, human readable steps, uh, live reports and so on and so forth. So it might be interesting. I'm like, not sure. I need to, I need more time to dig into it. But uh, anyway, curious project. So make sure to check it out. All right, this is it for the libraries and demos. Two last thing we got here is the first one is there is a new MDN web docs website that is uh, located under beta.developer.mozilla.org. And it actually builds using webs. Uh, what am I saying? It's actually built using React is what I want to say. So this is new MDN fully built using React. And there is like a ton of things here. Like obviously it's the same MDN as before. It's just a slightly different layout and built with React. So um, yeah, if you're curious, do check it out. Give them feedback. Uh, it's always kind of cool. Right. And the last thing I want to highlight is this article from Ars Technica, my browser, the spy, how extensions slurped up browsing histories from 4 million users. And it's essentially a look into one of the studies published by the scientific researchers, uh, security researchers that discovered a bunch of Chrome and Firefox extensions that uh, essentially steal your data. So make sure to have a look at the list here. It's actually really painful to see how there's a lot of 
extensions that are aimed at accessibility that actually do this, like, you know, text to speech or enlarging images. And yeah, it's not, not very nice. So, you know, make sure to check the list and then look at your relatives and friends and make sure they don't actually use any of those. What does MDN start? MDN is Mozilla Developer Network. And uh, it is probably the best documentation on the web you can find for JavaScript and HTML and CSS. So quite highly recommended. If you never used it, like this is literally the site that I use 99% of time when I build anything for the... Um, for the front end uh, and for the back end as well sometimes because the JavaScript docs they have are also pretty outstanding. Okay, um, anyway, that is it from my side. So this was BXGS weekly episode 72. You can find all the links I mentioned on the GitHub or bxgs.dev website. If you have any questions, feel free to join our Discord server and ask them there. Or if you are watching this right now, you can throw anything into the chat. Uh, if you have any questions, ask them. If you have any links I might've missed, or projects you want to share, do throw them in there right now. If not, then we can just wrap this up here. And um, I guess I'm going to go be sick and you go have a great weekend. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not, not, not the most fun weekend I would have. But hey, you know, happens sometimes. All right. Um, yeah, doesn't seem like there's any more questions or suggestions. Once again, uh, the VOD for this will be available immediately on Twitch and in a few minutes on or hours, I guess, on YouTube. Uh, if you have any questions, join the Discord server and ask them there. I'm almost always there and there's a lot of people who can help you uh, in addition to me. Right, that is basically it from my side. So thank you guys very much for watching. Have an awesome uh, rest of the weekend or rest of the week and I see you next time. Bye.